Welcome back to this episode of Shapes of Grief. I'm joined by American author Andy Gillitz. Andy, you're very, very welcome. Thank you so much, Liz. I'm so happy to be here with you and your audience. Um, Andy is the author of After Effects, a memoir of complicated grief. And this is so timely, Andy, because I don't know if you saw the article that came out in the New York Times. And I don't know about you, but my newsfeed um, on social media over the last couple of days has been filled with people up in arms about the pathologizing of grief. Um, somebody even sent me the article yesterday asking me, had I seen this horror, you know? And I said to her, have you read the article? And she said, well, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really, really interesting for a number of different reasons. You know, it's the article is about prolonged grief um, and its inclusion in the DSM-5. Right. Uh, it's been in the DSM-5 for quite some time. They've just changed the name of it. But seeing people's reactions, it's really interesting. Um, so maybe we'll come back to that. Um, first, I want to hear about your story. Um, and for listeners, you know, Andy's book, After Effects, a memoir of complicated grief. Complicated grief was the name given previously to prolonged grief disorder. Yes. And the fact that it's, we called it complicated didn't really reflect what we were talking about. Um, when we call it prolonged grief disorder, we're not talking about normative grief. We're not talking about normative grief that can endure a long time. We're talking about a small section of the population that suffer debilitating effects from their grief over a prolonged period of time. Um, is that how you would define it, Andy? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that um, grief, because grief is a part of life and there is nothing abnormal about grieving after you have lost a loved one. Um, but there are cultural and social norms regarding grief. And we are, and <clears throat> we, many of us are part of faith communities that have conventions and practices around grief and mourning. Um, and all these um, are, as, as in, in the West especially, um, we are um, used to thinking of grief as something that is acute for maybe a couple of months. I just read a study yesterday um, in which the authors um, rely on some statistics that said that grief peaks, it's the intensity of grief peaks at about two months after, after the loss and then begins to slowly moderate. And so that results in a, in a wide convention here um, in uh, Europe and, and uh, North America um, that quote unquote normal grief generally lasts about a year. And if it persists for longer than that, and <clears throat> you made such an important point, if it's debilitating, if you're stuck in it, um, if you can't seem to go on, then that part is not normal. Yeah. That part is as um, I, I think many in your audience, and I know you too, Liz, are familiar with the work of Dr. Catherine Shear at um, Columbia University's center. It is now called the Center for Prolonged Grief. Um, but Dr. Shear calls this grief gone awry. It doesn't follow a normal course, which that normal course, however slowly and gradually, leads to what we think of as recovery. Yeah, recovery being an integrated grief. We've learned to carry it. We've accommodated it. It's manageable. It doesn't mean it's gone. <laughs> and this is where people are up in arms, I think, you know, over this article. Um, but you said it beautifully there, Andy, like 
after a year, maybe that really acute grief where your entire life is seen through the lens of loss, we should begin to see integration. It's not that you're better. It's not that your grief is gone. It's not that you're cured or healed or saved. Grief we know endures a long time. But as we've both said, when it's debilitating, then it's problematic. And what I see as a real problem, and it made me so mad over the last few days, there's so many people on Instagram or Facebook or who are grief, sprung up grief educators because they've had an experience of loss and they're now educating people as to what loss is. But it's not. That's your experience of loss. <laughs> that's yeah. your experience of trauma. That's your experience of grief. And that cannot be applied universally. And, you know, my call for people is we need to think critically. There's a whole possible spectrum of responses to grief. And yours is somewhere in there. But we have to be so aware of here's my response to this one loss. My response to another loss was completely different. And just because I don't suffer from prolonged grief disorder, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist for somebody else. In fact, the research tells us that about 10 to 20 percent of the bereaved population will experience prolonged grief disorder, which is grief that endures in a debilitating way. You know, it's it's not grief that endures is grief that endures. That's fairly normal. When someone we love dies, we don't turn off our love for them or our grief for their loss after a year. Nobody is suggesting that. But what this article is saying, and I thought it said clearly, but people didn't read it fully, I believe. Um, People are saying, oh, they're telling us that we shouldn't grieve after a year. Nobody's saying that. Nobody's saying that. And and the article didn't say that either. Andy, let's go back to your loss. Who did you lose? When did you lose them? How did it start? When did they die? Um, I lost my husband um, in the summer of 1998. So we're talking um, 20, almost 24 years ago. It will be 24 years uh, he died on July 28, 1998. And um, for your audience, and you know this, Liz, we emailed, um, uh, I am here in my hometown of St. Paul, Minnesota, um, where we just had a rousing St. Patrick's Day celebration. <laughs> Good to hear us. Uh, so he was diagnosed with, um, with some kind of chest cancer. They never found a primary tumor five months before he died. Um, He had not been feeling well for months before that. But we, you write things off, especially he had just turned 52 years old when he died. So he died in the prime of life. And um, let me hear say a couple of the things that might um, uh, help in, in knowing how um, experts, and by experts, I mean researchers in, in the field of prolonged grief disorder, including most prominently um, Catherine Shearer. Uh, one risk, some of the risk factors for complicated grief are losing a very close loved one, meaning uh, a parent, a sibling, a spouse, a child, uh, when that person is in the prime of life. Um, Another risk factor is um, an extremely close relationship with the person you've lost. So in my case, that was my spouse and we didn't have children. So we were devoted, deeply devoted to one another until Tom's death. Um, so those are just a couple risk factors and I think I must have um, exhibited them in spades because uh, I I was never the same we always have to look at the relationship don't we Andy it's not just losing a spouse will determine whether you've prolonged grief or not 
It's, you know, what was the relationship with the spas? Were there other relationships? Was there a big community? Were there children? Or was this person your everything? You yes, know? that's exactly right. And I don't, I want to share my belief that it is a blessing to have an intimately close relationship over a long, long time with a significant other. That we should never hold back and think, oh my gosh, I'm gonna feel so badly if he dies. And <laughs> But that isn't the nature of human relationships. We want to be close, we want to be intimate. That is part of what the COVID pandemic has taken from us. Um, the close intimacy, um, and, and it is also why some of the experts, um, and I think the Times article touched on this, um, uh, worry that um, with so many of us grieving over loved ones we've lost to COVID, that the risk for prolonged grief disorder has risen. Yeah, absolutely, because we've lost a lot of our community supports or weren't able to access them during those times. I was bereaved during the pandemic myself, and we had a miserable funeral of 10. And it wasn't a miserable funeral. It was a small funeral of 10. <laughs> and equally, you know, friends who would have been around me just weren't, you know. Um, yeah. Thankfully, I was okay. But had that been a shocking, unexpected death, um, or a significant, very significant loss for me. I, I might not be sitting here today able to function so well, you, you know. know. Yes, thank you, Liz. I, um, I, you know, I touch on this in After Effect. Um, I lost my parents. Um, my mother was 84 and we all felt she, she had been quite, quite ill. And we all felt that she was too young to die. But I always, my, my mantra now, my motto is that no one you love is ever old enough to die. Um, when my father died at 93, um, we all wished that he had lived longer. And yet at the same time, those were two very significant losses in my life, but they didn't affect me the way that losing my husband, Tom, did. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to add there, Andy, my father was 92. And yeah. I am okay that he died. Yes. And I am okay that he didn't have more years. And I'm grateful that he had a good death. And yes. I say that just to say your reality is true. And my reality is true. And they're different. <laughs> and this is so important when we're looking at grief. Um, we hold all these differences. Yes, you're so right. It's grief is individualized down to each one of us um and now i've lost my thought of course <laughs> yes, you we're, know, we're, what we're you were saying there was when you talked about your parents that it you still didn't want them to die you still wanted more years however it did not affect you in the same way as tom's death did no and in fact they had lived they were i'm one of six uh siblings and um they they took so much joy from their children that they both lived long and rich lives. Um, I, I think um, when a life is cut short uh, for whatever reason, that um, that puts us at greater risk for um, deeper, longer, intense grief. One of the things about prolonged grief disorder is that the grief our grief remains acute for a very, very long time. When you talked about um, how we come to terms, it's not that we ever forget um, or can be who we were fully before we suffered that loss. Um, there's a famous grief counselor whose name, of course, I can never remember, <laughs> who says that grief becomes a fixed part of character. And as Kathy Shear says, at some point, just as you were saying, Liz, grief, our grief becomes more muted. It becomes moderated. It, it finds a place within us that allows us 
to um, not be our grief that allows us to become whole again, but in a different way. Yes. I love that idea of the volume as well. You know, when you talk about acute grief, what I, how I explain this to people is when someone we love dies, our grief is very acute. The volume is right up there. Um, we see everything through the lens of loss. Everything is measured, seen, heard through this lens of lo of loss or love either. Um, oh. and, and, and the volume is up here for a period of time. And that, that can be different if we were expecting it or if we're okay with it or anticipated it. Maybe the volume starts to come down relatively soon. For other people, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it takes months, maybe even more than a year. But eventually or gradually, we start to see the volume come down. And it's, we, we begin to be able to see over the grief and to be able to see other things as well as the grief. Yes. And that's a sign that we're beginning to integrate it. We're beginning to carry it. We're assimilating it. You know, we're adapting to life without the person we love. It's still there, but it's just, it's softening. The volume is coming down. Yes. And then what I say to people with prolonged grief disorder your volume hasn't gone down. Your volume is still up here, despite the fact that two, three, four, five, ten years have passed. They will still talk about their loved one as if they had died last week. Yes. And they are still experiencing life wholly through that lens of loss. Nothing has been integrated. They are still looking back at the loss as if, if only I'd gone sooner, if only I'd been there, if only something had been different, if only we'd been to the doctor, there's not an acceptance of the reality of the loss. They right. know they're dead, but they have not accepted that this is real at some level. And, you know, Liz, that is really one of the hallmarks of prolonged grief disorder is um, the, the inability to believe that your loved one is really gone uh, and won't come back. Yeah. And I think I'm, I know I'm not the only one, but in After Effects, I tell um, some of my experiences of, um, I, I believe a lot of us who have endured significant losses have found this. And especially during the first year or two, I would hear Tom in the house I would imagine that he was opening the refrigerator or closing a door uh, or coming into the house from outside. Um, I would hear his voice. Um, and, and this went on for, um, as I say, probably uh, at least a, two years maybe, but that was not the extent of my grief. I was um, drowning, literally drowning in grief for almost a decade. And in After Effects, um, I, the way I tell my story is it came to me as, as I was trying to write all this. And remember, I could not bear to even, I, I couldn't bear to take pen to paper um, for 19 years. So, <laughs> uh, and, but as I wrote, it sounds trite to say it, as I wrote, I healed. And, um, and for some people, writing is not that path, but I ended up dividing the book into two parts and I call them drowning and surfacing. Oh, yeah. Nice. And the book covers about two decades, and in that first decade, I was drowning in grief for years on end. And then finally, what was it? Was it the passage of time? Was it um, doing a different kind of work? I talk about that. Was it finding different friends? I talk about that. But whatever it was, I reached internally 
a point of readiness to reconcile myself. Mm-hmm. Finally, I felt ready, not knowing it. Yeah. I wasn't conscious of it. I'm wondering, like, something that I've seen, Andy, in clinical practice, because I've actually accompanied many people now through what was complicated grief therapy, now yes. prolonged grief therapy. But what I hear from all of them is it's like that lovely Anais Nin quote when the pain of remaining in the bud becomes too much, we need to find a way to flower. And for them, it's like, it's like I need to either die or find a way out of this, but I'm destroyed. I'm destroyed. And I want to stop living in a way that's destroying me. I, I use those words, but that's more or less what I hear from people is I have no quality of life. I don't love, I don't make love, I don't go for walks, I don't appreciate food. There is, there is joyless, you know, and, and the other thing in common is they don't believe that anyone or anything will ever help them unless someone can bring back their loved one. Um, You know, oh, I just love what you're saying. And I'm so grateful to hear you say it. Um, I, I think one of the things that happened to me was when I reached some of those turning points uh, that helped me heal, um, I was certainly wasn't aware of it. I could never have said to myself, my value has been up too high. I had no insight into my own being all that time. Um, no, I had lost my sense of self-observation. So I was deeply within my grief with, without being capable of um, observing it. Uh, and I think um, C.S. Lewis, you know, that title, A Grief Observed, um, what internal... Um, I don't know how to put it exactly, but the sheer internal courage, the impetus to be able to express the depth of feeling that he experienced is um, is something that in my experience, I would have been completely unable to do. And I think one of the things, one of the great services that you are doing is to help people who are suffering reclaim that sense of self-examination. Yeah, I think it's key. I I spoke with my last podcast guest about this, Andy, the importance of being able to bear witness to our own process. We need to be able to develop that part of ourselves that can sort of remove ourselves ever so slightly to be able to witness, well, what is going on here in these friendships or this relationship or in my process? What stories am I telling myself? What behaviors? We need to look at ourselves and then, you know, accompany ourselves in, in doing things differently if, if what we're doing isn't working. Yes. Andy, can we go back to those 10 years you said you were drowning in your grief? And I feel so passionate about this because I really want people to hear how different prolonged grief disorder is to a normative grief process. You know, your husband died suddenly, he was young, and he was your everything is what I'm hearing. Of course you were going to be grieving and still grieving and missing him. Nobody is denying that. Of course that would have been there anyway, but what were the extra layers that made your grief part of that slice, not normative? I I think I would characterize what happened to me as um, a brutal extension of acute grief. So when you talked about the idea of seeing the world through the lens of our loss, that is what happened to me. And so when it was time for me to return to my job, for example, it was all I could do to get to work every day. My job which I was blessed to have. I had a very challenging, but very meaningful and I think important job um, 
that I was blessed to be able to have and I could not do it. I couldn't do my work properly. Literally, I I came to work this, and I, I need to say, Liz, this went on for, I don't know, eight years. Mm -hmm. um, and it became a habit. So I think what happened to me is I was addicted to my grief. It became my friend. Um, and so I would make excuses for myself. I would get by with the minimum because I had no strength for anything more. I would, I was a heavy smoker. And after having your husband die of what was presumed to be lung cancer, you'd think that would have inspired me to quit smoking, but I was grieving so hard. I smoked more. Um, and so there I was, and I and I couldn't smoke at my job. So I was in Minnesota. It really can be uh, 20 degrees below Fahrenheit um, in the winter. And I would be putting on a parka, leaving my desk, and going for a cigarette in below Fahrenheit zero weather. And, um, and of course, the cold, the harshness of that cold would have me in a hacking cough. Um, and this went on um, for, I quit smoking in 2007. So that was, I, it went on for nine years. That was one thing. The other thing was, I literally could not keep my food down for years. Wow. Um, and when you, when you said, you lose interest in food. Tom and I had savored our food together. We were we were good eaters, as they say. <laughs> uh, and um, but after he died, I couldn't. I I have I I talk in the book importantly about uh, not only the emphysema that uh, that I have that I now live with. But also, I also have Crohn's disease, which after Tom died, it worsened precipitously. Yeah. So in my, my effort to go to work every day, most days I could not leave for work because I was tethered to the bathroom. Yeah. Uh, the loop. And um, so I would get to work an hour or two late and, and what do you say? These things are personal. I, I, I tried, I spent years working to hide all this from my colleagues. Um, and I had a couple of talking tos about not being at work enough, not working hard enough. Um, and, um, but that rolled off my back. So, <laughs> um, and then um, I think, I wonder if, um, I don't know what you're feeling about this is, but I think this is an important topic for clinicians is um, I began to get tired of it. It began to be too big a burden to carry. All the of it. And the lifestyle it created for me, which was no life at all. Yeah. Um, my family even were on uh, tender feet with me um, because they were afraid, they were afraid of me. <laughs> I was a pariah. Um, and, um, and I'm not sure, I talk in After Effects about my uncertainty about how was it that I came to, as I say in the book, to surface, to to begin to surface and come up for air um, after all those years. I I don't know the reason, but I, I think that at least part of it was it just became tiring. I was weary of it. I was tired of it. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's it interesting you know do we exhaust ourselves with our grief eventually 
you know, is there, does it come a point where the burden of it is too much to carry? And certainly after two decades, you know, but it sounds like there was a choice point, you know, for some that comes in quite early. You know, I remember when my father was dying, before he was dead, I chose, I'm not going to let this pull me down because you know, I've been through a separation a few years before, which really pulled me down for many years. And I really had to sort of scale it and and recover from it, you know, and build myself back together again. And I remember thinking that that's not going to happen. It can't happen. <laughs> I've got kids and a life and work and, you know, but also part of me knew this is not the, the mammoth loss that you experienced. I knew that was probably not going to be my experience but I consciously chose mind yourself be careful be yes. careful the stories I tell myself not everybody can and if it was my 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 lover my spouse or my child I would not be able to do that I'm quite sure but I do think for many people a choice point comes yes and I don't know as as you know I don't know can we find that if we're aware of it can we find it sooner but, you know, what was interesting to me, watching all the reactions to the New York Times article of all the people who, how dare you tell me my grief has a time limit. Um, it's like, yeah. oh, we're, we're, nobody's saying that for a start, but aren't we very attached to our grief as well? Um, you know, I think I think one of the people who really pointed this out to me, Andy, was an, an American woman called Autumn, a young mom whose husband died suddenly. And then her she had a series of losses and then a child died okay. um, before she'd even hit 34. And she's been on my podcast and Autumn talks about a moment where someone sent her a meme, you know, a funny joke. And she started laughing and then, then was like, oh, I can't laugh. Everyone's dead. I, I'm not meant to be laughing. And then she was like, but I want to laugh. And suddenly she had this choice point of, mm -hmm. am I going to not laugh and take this as the cross I have to carry for the rest of my life? Or can I choose something different? And it was just an interesting concept to me. And it's something I listen for a lot now, these moments of choice. Jill Mann talks about it in both the podcast and the grief training program I have. How do we look for those choice points? And right. for some, it comes before someone has died. For some, for others, it comes quite early on in the bereavement experience. And for others, it takes two decades. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it took you two decades. Indeed. Your grief connected you to Tom. Um, you know, indeed it did. Um, the Sometimes I think of those last 10 years as what I would call unresolved grief. And I, But I, I would like, if it's okay, to tell you a story about one of my important choice points. Um, I, I hadn't... That phrase is... Um, is a wonderful one, it, you know, the, the blessing of self-awareness, you know, <laughs> and, um, but in 2007, um, I believe it was, maybe 2006, so this would have been eight years after Tom died, I had a colleague um, at work. One of the things that happened to me immediately after Tom died is that I could no longer listen to music. Uh, one of the great loves of my life. I had a mammoth collection of vinyl records um, and um, I, I, I loved learning about music. I, I loved listening to music. But when Tom died, I couldn't bear it anymore. And I packed up our um, stereo equipment and took it into the basement and with the idea that I would never see it or use it again. Uh, and then this would have been in 2006, I was working with a colleague, um, a technology professional um, 
and uh, on a project. And I went one afternoon, he worked in a cubicle uh, in, in a large room with many cubicles. And I went to visit him in his cubicle to do some work together. And I noticed on the shelf above his desk, um, a compact disc. And um, whether you're um, in Ireland, or, uh, and I, I think in, your, in Europe as a whole, many people um, are familiar with um, the late Towns Van Zandt, a singer songwriter. And uh, I saw this compact disc and I picked it up and I looked at it and um, it was a live recording of Towns Van Zandt at a, at a music club, um, I believe in Texas. And I noticed that um, one of the songs on this album was a song called Poncho and Lefty, uh, a kind of a folk uh, country light rock song. But I was familiar with that song because I was a fan of um, Emmy Lou Harris, an American country singer. And she sang that song and it was one of my all time favorite songs. I just loved it. And I was so surprised to see it on this album. And I asked my colleague about it and he said, oh, Towns Van Zandt wrote that song. And I was just, oh, as a music lover, all of a sudden something lit up in me that hadn't been there for, you know, eight years. And I said, can I, will you loan me this CD? And without thinking, I wasn't aware of that choice point at all. On my way home from work that day, I slipped that CD into my car player and lo and behold, I was listening to music again. The <laughs> next day, I went down into my basement called all the stereo equipment up from the basement and started listening to music again. Yeah. And that, I think, if I understand what you mean by a choice point, but it was such an unintentional choice point. Yeah. Here's the difference, Andy, because it's like that happened for you, but you didn't choose it. It just happened. When we can cultivate this witness in ourselves, Yes. Then we can choose, right? Yes, it's, exactly. it's like um, Viktor Frankl's quote, you know, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies your freedom or your ability to choose. Yes, and in yes. that choice lies your freedom, something like that. Yes, exactly. You know, but that space is the ability to witness what's happening. I've been triggered. I'm about to react, but instead I'm going to pause. I'm going to look in and assess. And instead of reacting unconsciously, I'm going to respond consciously. And it's developing that part of us that can witness ourselves. Exactly. Had you developed that a little sooner, you might have been able to go down sooner to get your music. Yes, perhaps. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I also think, Liz, that um, for those that, that uh, choose to um, read After Effects, um, that was really the first in a series of life changes that helped me. I, I have to say that for me, I, I'm not, um, it's hard for me to embrace the word recovery. I'm more comfortable with the word reconciliation because Tom lives within me. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't, can you imagine, of course you don't want to forget the one uh, you loved so deeply and for so long. Yeah, so how, I mean, for me, that the, the healing challenge was finding that place. Um, and, and, you know, the, the point you make, the point about the part of us that and step back and witness our own lives. When Tom died, I lost that. Um, I had felt myself to be a self-aware person before that, my whole life. Yeah. Um, and it took all this time, but I feel like um, 
we can never go back. Uh, um, Isaac Bashevis Singer says, the pages of our lives can only be turned forward, never back. Yeah. And um, uh, so I am not, of course, the person I was um, up until Tom died, but I feel that I am equally capable now of experiencing joy. When you talked about a joyless life, I really resonate with that. I, I We must, um, uh, that capacity to experience joy, it can come from the smallest places. Um, and I also think that we, you also touched on this too. One of the things I learned through writing After Effects is I don't think we can privilege one kind of joy over another. Um, uh, we, the beauty of life is to accept and rejoice in that which makes us happy, no matter where it comes from. Um, assuming that we can um, maintain ourselves as upright people. Hmm. I like the words that you used there when you were talking about Tom and your grief and how recovery or healing are not words in your vocabulary, reconciliation. And, and that's so true. We know that, you know, grief endures, but it can endure in a manageable way that still gives us access to other lenses, you know, to view, to view life through. And, you know, I really want to honor Kathy Shear, actually, Dr. Kathy Shear, because I've worked now maybe seven or eight years uniquely supporting people through their experience of loss and grief. And for most people, if they're having a normative grief experience. But I would say, you know, there is a percentage of people who come who are suffering from prolonged grief disorder. Their lives are on pause. There is no joy. They are not able to re-engage with life. They are still looking back. There is no looking forward. There is no room for relationships, for friendships. Um, life as they knew it is unrecognizable. And the, and the key thing with prolonged grief disorder is the volume is still up on the grief and it has endured for years. Yes. You know, maybe three years, five years, 10 years. And Kathy Shear has developed a 16 week protocol, formerly known as complicated grief therapy, now known as prolonged grief therapy. And it really can make a big difference. Um, I know that as a clinician that has used this protocol over 20 times now, um, internationally and here in Ireland, it makes a difference. It gives people back their lives. Yes, their lives with grief. Yes, they still miss their loved one and they can make plans for their future. They have hopes and dreams and aspirations for themselves again. They're not still waking up at two o'clock in the morning, 10 years after their loved one has died, trying to figure out what to do with these intrusive thoughts. Um, yeah. Really important to honor Kathy and, and her work. She um, was very kind to me when I um, was working on my manuscript and you probably saw that she wrote a lovely endorsement um, of my book. Um, I admire her so much and I think I credit her as I was writing the memoir. It was her work uh, as I was doing research yeah. that uh, turned the light bulb on in my mind. And, and it's so important you talking about this, Andy, and the generosity of sharing your story because it does make a difference. You know, um, somebody came to me, she came across Kathy Shear's work online and contacted Kathy, but because she was in Europe, Kathy put her in touch with Dr. Susan Delaney from the Irish Hospice Foundation, who happened to be my supervisor, who oh. put her in touch with me. We worked together for 16 weeks. She turned her life around. Oh, that is um, now, Fiona has spoken openly and publicly about this, so I'm not breaking 
any client confidentiality, but when Fiona came to me, and I will share her testimony, actually, I'll share a link to it. It's currently only on the grief education series I've produced. But following the, the, the outrage of this article, I want to share it publicly. Fiona was in a, uh, she would just sit on her sofa all day. She lived in fear that her dogs were going to die. How would she cope? This was 10 years after her dad had died and she wasn't able to engage with her children. She hated travel. She looked forward to nothing. And she, she wanted to die because she couldn't see any other option available to her that had any meaning in it. And, you know, like almost everyone I've worked with with prolonged grief disorder, I'm going, gosh, will this, you know, this, this woman is pretty intense in her grief. It's, you know, will, will this make a difference? But it does. It does make a difference. Absolutely. Fiona went on, she bought a bike, she started growing trees in her patio, she did. Yo she started attending a yoga class, then did a yoga teacher training. Her life is unrecognizable, and I have 20 stories like that that I could share. Yes. Um, another young man, James, shared his story. 13 years after his mother died, he was on cocaine, he was drinking heavily, he wasn't able to study. He wasn't able to concentrate. His life was off the rails. He wasn't able to get it back on. He still wore the same clothes he had worn as a teenager 13 years previously when his mom died. He was still playing the same video games that he played when his mom died 13 years previously. Her wardrobe was untouched in 13 years. Her clothes were still on the floor where she had left them before she died. So we're talking about frozen in time. And again, with Kathy Shear's protocol, with a compassionate therapist, you know, and with hope yeah. and belief in someone, everything changed. Yeah. You know, the relationship got better. He stopped using, he stopped drinking. He went back to college. He achieved his degree that he was trying to get. Right. He's now thinking about studying counseling. You know, and there, there's example after example after example. So for anyone listening, when we're talking about prolonged grief disorder and it being in the DSM and it being, you know, um, considered a psychiatric illness, it really is not normative grief that we're talking about. Nobody all. is pathologizing grief. We are talking about a small section of the bereaved population whose lives are literally debilitated, destroyed as a result of their response to a loss several years previously. Yes. And Liz, let me ask you, um, as part of our conversation, what is your feeling about the value of memoirs? Um, I, I, the thing that strikes me since my book was published last month is the desire to share and hear one's stories, I mean, of grief. I mean, I think this is, um, I have been amazed at the, literally the, the healing power of not only my story, but the stories you're telling are um, so powerful and, and also so inspirational. That word hope, uh, is so important if we can cross over in into that realm, the realm of hope. Uh, we are. Uh, this is a gift that we give ourselves. The other thing I wanted to just note in what you said is that one thing about reconciliation is that it's not that we ever we don't lose grief. It, we don't forget it or whatever. But to me, I know this will sound like a contradiction, but we reach a point where it doesn't make us unhappy. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it, absolutely. And I think, see, for so many people, their grief is their link to their loved one. And they believe that if they let go of the grief yes. or don't feel intense grief anymore, there can be huge shame, there can be guilt, there can be, they, you know, I've heard people say, I feel like I'm disrespecting her if I'm not grieving all the time. 
you know, and, uh, you know, it's how do we change that to love? Like, how can we carry the love and the laughter and the memories um, rather than just grief to remember our loved ones? But also, I think it's really important for some people, they want to carry the loss as part of them throughout their lives. And if that's your choice, good on you, go, you know, go for it. So be it. If that's how you choose to, to deal with your loss and integrate it. Some other people say, I don't want this to define me. I don't want to carry this for the rest of my life. I want to be okay. Good on you. Good for you. Don't, you know, if that's how you want to do it, go for it. It's so personal. And, you know, there's that expression, it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to be okay too. Yes. You do your grief your way, <laughs> you know. But what we want to say in today's conversation is if your grief is debilitating and you don't want to be debilitated anymore, there is support. Yes. Maybe you are one of the 10% whose grief has got stuck. You yes. know, it hasn't followed a normal trajectory. Um, and there's help. And let me extend that. I want to return to this idea of sharing one another's stories. Yeah. Um, I have learned so much through our conversation today. Uh, uh, I, I'm so deeply grateful that you shared the experiences of some of your clients. These are the stories that we need to hear. They're the stories, yes, of intense suffering, but they, but they're also stories of transformation into the arena of hope. Yeah, yeah. I, and I just want to reiterate, Andy, that I have permission to share both of those stories yeah, and share publicly. There's so many more that I, I, I will never share, but there are more. Yeah. Yeah. Sharing stories is vital, Andy. People, it can be hard to read um, in in. in you know, the early months of grief and sometimes the early years, it can be hard to read and concentrate. So I think these conversations are invaluable for people to yeah. be able to just listen passively a few times. But so many people report to me that they go and buy the books of every author who's on the podcast, you know. Um, and it's because, the you know, I'd be grateful if people were interested, but I also... Um, I'm happy, just very happy to have this conversation and to become um, one more story um, in, uh, that I hope can be helpful. I, um, I think uh, I, want, I, I want to make one more point about that. Uh, in the second half of After Effects, uh, there was that turnaround where I began felt able to listen to music again. Um, and that led, it, that one opening, um, spiritual opening uh, or emotional opening led to honestly a series of many other changes that I wouldn't necessarily call intentional, but mm. one of the best things that happened to us is when something drops in our lap or comes our way somehow, and we're able to see that um, as a moment of hope and opportunity. Yeah. So I think, and I, I, I just love the stories that you told because they, they all put that together. Um, they have that in common. I, I wonder, um, do you, are, it, do you think it would be inappropriate for me to show what the cover of the book looks like? Oh, please do, please do. These, yeah. So After Effects, A Memoir of Complicated Grief yes. by Andrea Gillatz. Andrea. Uh, Gillatz. And I'm going to share a link in the description to where people can buy your book. So okay. if you want to email me a link, um, you might have already done that actually. I will certainly share that. But people report to me that you know, and we say this so often on the podcast, there, there's no words sometimes for what we experience. Yes. People call it like a tsunami or, you know, I've fallen apart and I don't know where the pieces of me are or a truckload of grief was dumped on me. You know, often people just 
don't have words. You know, my, one of my last guests said, it's like my nerve endings, my nervous system was on the outside. I was so sensitive and vulnerable. But I think when people find ways of describing their experience in the narrative of a, a memoir in their book, other people can read and go, there I am, there I am. And when we can see our experience mirrored in somebody else's experience, yeah. suddenly it renders it normal, you know? And it gives us hope then, because if someone else has experienced this, then maybe they know a way through. It, it makes me think also, Liz, that um, one of the things that I grew into as I, as I healed um, was um, that being alone doesn't mean that you're lonely. Um, you, you can be, um, you can be full and rich, uh, even though you may not, you may no longer have your spouse or you may not no longer have your child. Or, or in the case of people that you talked about, your parent. Um, but you are, you can live some of your life alone, but you are never, we, we are never alone. It's a nice message to leave it on, Andy. Yeah. Andy, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. A really timely conversation just after the New York Times article. I and know. I, hope, <laughs> I really hope that this conversation is demystified a little bit what yeah. we're talking about, you yes. know, we know that, and, and this, this is the work of the Irish Hospice Foundation, they've produced a pyramid um, based on all the decades of research available to us. And we know that in grief, 100% of people need information, <clears throat> they need their loss acknowledged, they need the support of community or family or friends. Everybody needs that. Everybody. Of that 100%, then 60%, that'll be enough. That will be enough for them. They will learn to integrate their grief. They will adapt to their loss. They will accommodate it. They will move forward, always loving their person, but they'll be okay. That's enough for them. We know that a further 30% of people will require something else. They might need a community group. They might need to meet someone else who's had a miscarriage. They may need to meet someone else who's been bereaved by suicide. You know, they might need to meet other people who are more aware of their specific loss and meet other people who've had that experience also. Um, or they might need counseling or psychotherapy um, to help them integrate their loss um, for whatever reason. And then we know that a further 10%, so 60% will be okay, 30% will need some additional supports and then another 10% will need specific intervention for prolonged grief. Yes. And we know that, you know, the only evidence for it at the moment and um, the only evidence-based intervention is prolonged grief therapy developed by Dr. Kathy Shear in Columbia University. And if you go to their website, I yes. think it's changed to, used to be the Center for Complicated Grief. I assume it's now the Center for Prolonged Grief. I think they have a new website. All yeah. the details are there. And they, I think they're actually redesigning their website, but so people understand there's, you can go to a part of um, their website, um, which is for professionals. Um, and then there is another part of the website that is specifically for members of the public. And um, that's something that is a, an excellent resource, um, I think, for people to offer their clients. In fact, what I, I've always wondered about this, you know, one of the things that as we close, Liz, I, I, I only now do I understand that um, many, many people have asked me after Tom died, did I seek grief counseling? Did I seek therapy and counseling? But the truth is that in 1998, there was no such thing. Um, 
the work on prolonged grief disorder, complicated grief, um, Kathy Shear and others, um, that work is only in the last couple of decades. And, um, and, and she worked tirelessly along with others to get some kind of recognition for this reality. Um, so I think um, it, that's such an important point to make. Um, I let me leave it there. Yeah, and I think it's it's good to say thank you again to Dr. Kathy Shear. Absolutely. Um, thank you to you, Andy, for sharing your experience yeah. and your story, for proving that it's a thing for long grief disorder. I'd like to thank anyone I've worked with also who's shared their story and to thank Dr. Susan Delaney who learned from Kathy Shear and passed it on to me and a few others in Ireland. Um, it's so important that we speak up and out because my fear now is that people reading the re responses to that article, you know, will start to think that maybe there's something wrong with them or they won't seek out the help that um, could be really beneficial to them. So to anyone listening as well, if you had a reaction to that article, I'd say, go read it again, slowly, and read what's actually being said. <laughs> you know, this is a good time to say that I feel like I'm fully sane. I, I'm a sane and sort of average gal. <laughs> um, That's great. Uh, this, you know, um, I worry a little bit about um, sort of lumping too many things together. I also worry, Liz, that I have been amazed at how many people don't understand that there are varieties of grief. That as you talked about, uh, some people react in this way or whatever, and that it is very individualized even within specific cultures. Yeah. So I, I think that's such an important point and counters a little bit. Um, the occasion of, I also think it's important to point out, especially for clinicians, that including now prolonged grief disorder in the DSM, the, one of the important implications of that is that people who are suffering from prolonged grief disorder, which we need to be careful, is that small segment of people suffering from prolonged debilitating grief, that now that that disorder is in the DSM, it makes it possible for people to file insurance claims uh, for that treatment and, be in re and insurance companies are now required to reimburse them. Yeah. So they can get reimbursed for it. But also to say it's not new to the DSM-5. It's been there under complex bereavement. Um, right. But the Center for Complicated Grief, they've just, it's not that they've rebranded or they're remarketing. It's just that the, the term complicated grief didn't adequately portray the disorder. It's, the, it's a sense of prolonging, prolonging a, debilita a prolonged debilitating grief. Um, yeah. Of course, grief endures, but it doesn't endure in a debilitating way. So I think I think we've got the message out there, Andy. I hope so. Yes, <laughs> Liz, for all your work, I'm so grateful to you. Thank you for contacting me in the first place. Well, you contacted me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. Well, it's what a reward. Thank you so much. It's great you did. So thank you for that. And um, best of luck with the book. I know it will change lives. Thank you. Is there a way that I will be able to watch the podcast? Absolutely. I'll send you all the links. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, thank you, Liz, for everything. Please let me know if I can ever help in any way. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Andy. Mind Bye. yourself. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.